Hey, Idex, I got you a gift. What is it? Hmm, shoes. While I appreciate the sentiment, this goes against my distinct clothing style of green shorts and green eyeglasses. Well, I just wanted you not to feel unimaginable pain when stepping on Legos. That's all. <laughs> when will I ever step on a Lego? And also, I doubt that stepping on Legos actually hurts that much. And now, I give you my brand new sculpture, the Code Block. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All zero of you that showed up. I'm gonna pop you, you stupid blueberry! Uh oh. See? Also, stepping on Legos is actually classified as a war crime in some countries. Hey everyone, this video is about Algol. No, I'm not talking about that one star, which is apparently also referred to as the Demon Star. I'm talking about the programming language. The algorithmic language, shortened to Algol, was developed by European and American computer scientists in 1958 at a university known as... Oh man. Eidgenössische Technische Hochschule Zürich. I tried. Algol's noteworthy for being the ancestor to most programming languages used today. Algol eventually influenced C, which itself influenced C++, Java, Python, and Garbage! And many, many others. Now you may be asking, What's so special about Algol that would make it so influential? I mean, nobody seems to use it anymore. Well, what if I told you that Algol was the first language to introduce a feature that would go on to be used in almost all Algol-like languages, and even some non-Algol-like languages? The block statement. In C, for example, when you want an if statement or a loop or a function to take up several lines, you place that code within curly braces. Using this, you can group statements together into a single block. In Algol, instead of being represented by curly brackets, these blocks are represented by begin and end. There were three major versions of Algol. Algol 58 was the first version, created in 1958. Algol 60 was a revision that occurred in 1960. And then there's Algol 68. Nobody really liked Algol 68, and it was meant with, quote, shock, horror, and dissent. So, how much shock, horror, and dissent are we talking about? Well, shortly after the publication of Algol 68, a paper was written by someone who tried to study it, dubbed Algol 68 with fewer tears. So, because of that massive backlash, I guess they decided not to make any further versions of Algol. In this video, I will be using a version of Algol 60 for MS-DOS that was originally designed for the Z80 microprocessor. This is because it was the first Algol 60 compiler that I could get to work. Fun fact about this compiler, if you run it incorrectly, it will let you put in the input again. But it won't let you stop putting in inputs. Did you try pressing Control c Like it says in the manual? Yes! And it didn't work! But, assuming the compiling is formatted correctly, it generates a runnable file from the Algol code, which can be fed into the Algol runner. Yay. So, here's a fun fact about Algol 60. It doesn't have standardized I.O. functionality. That means that every version of Algol does inputting and outputting slightly differently. Hooray! That means, if you try to compile Algol code for one implementation into another implementation, it will probably break. So Algol programmers must rewrite whole swaths of code in order for their programs to work on other machines. <laughs> Algol programmers must suffer. <laughs> Go away, obfuscate. But, nevertheless, here's the Hello World program in this version of Algol. It has a single block containing the whole program, which is just the function call that prints out Hello World. So, that's nice, but what does that one argument mean? No idea! But if it's anything other than one, it doesn't work. Yeah, I have no clue what this is for. Also, standard Algol keywords like begin and end must be capitalized, while everything else must be lowercase. And if you don't like that, you can put everything in uppercase. But the keywords need to be in single quotes. 
That hurts my eyes, so I won't be doing it. So yeah, this is a Hello World program. Mm, nothing special about it, really. So here's something more interesting. A program that prints the lyrics to the song 99 Bottles of Beer on the Wall. Unlike the Hello World program, this program needs to store data, which is stored in the integer x. And here we have a for loop. The for loop is formatted in a similar way to the C-style for loop we all know and love, just in a different order. Also, instead of semicolons, the parts of the for loop are separated by the keywords step and until. X starts at the value 99, and it has negative 1 added to it on each step through the loop, until it hits 1. Inside of the for loop is a block statement, which prints the verse of the song corresponding to whatever X is. Now in this version of Algol, the text procedure is only used for printing, you guessed it, text. To print integers, you must use write. And so we use write to print the value of x. Also, this asterisk n is actually the algol way of writing the new line character, so it prints new lines after every line of the song. Wait a sec, it says one bottles of beer instead of one bottle of beer. Eh, who cares? I do? Well, I really don't. Algol also has the ability to use functions. This function here, written as an integer procedure, takes in the parameter of an integer x passed by value. To return the value from an Algol function, you set the function's value as if it were a variable. This is kinda hard to see in the middle of a function, and I guess it's why the return keyword was added in C, but I can't really fault Algol for that too much because Algol was created very early on. So, uh, what's the point of this function? It just seems to return whatever was put into it. Yes, that's exactly what it does. So, what's the practical use for it if I could just write the number? NOTHING! But we can easily create a function that actually does something. The factorial operator, which is identified by yelling your chosen number, multiplies that number by every integer lower than it going down to 1. Because if it went any lower than 1, it would just be 0. But here's the fun thing about factorial. 5 factorial is just 5 times 4 factorial. 4 factorial is just 4 times 3 factorial, and so on and so forth. That means that factorials get really big really, really quickly. But that also means factorials can be written recursively! Did you mean recursion? 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 So if the input passed into the factorial function x is 1, then we just output 1 since you can't get any lower than 1 factorial without hitting 0. Otherwise, we multiply x by the factorial of x minus 1. This has the effect of doing exactly what I described, so 5 would be 5 times 4 factorial, 4 would be 4 times 3 factorial, 3 would be 3 times 2 factorial, and so on and so forth. So, we can now simply put the read function, which reads an integer from the user, into the input of the factorial function, and we can make a factorial calculator. Now, we just need to write the result. Hooray for putting functions in functions! Hold on, why does it only work up to 7 factorial? That's because the integers used here are 16-bit signed integers, meaning they can go up to 32,767 before they wrap back around to the negatives. 8 factorial is 40,320, so it wraps around and becomes negative. And any higher factorials would do the same thing. Anyway, if you want to try out this version of Algo for yourself, you can find a link to it in the description. It doesn't run on Windows, but it can be run in DOSBox. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time!